Welcome to The Report Card, where we evaluate efforts to improve the lives of families, schools, and students. Among those whose work has been most impacted by the coronavirus pandemic are teachers. In just a few weeks, nearly all of the nation's 3.6 million elementary and secondary school teachers have had to reorient their carefully crafted lesson plans for distance learning. What's more, many of them have had mere days to familiarize themselves with online learning tools they haven't previously used. So how are they coping? On this episode of The Report Card, I invited three teachers to talk to us and tell us. Joining us from Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania is William Bell, a third grade teacher at Hillcrest Elementary School with 25 years of experience. From Columbia, Missouri, six-year teaching veteran Alex Wendell, who teaches eighth grade English at Jefferson Middle School, is joining us. Also joining us is Rob Casilli, a 10th grade geometry teacher at Democracy Prep Harlem High School in New York City, currently in his eighth year of teaching. William, Alex, Rob, thanks for coming on the report card. Glad to be here. You're welcome. Really excited. So first off, how are you all doing in this tumultuous time? I mean, your expectations for March have certainly been turned on end. How are things going in, uh, in each of your respective lives? I would say that as teachers, even though it's a very challenging time, I do feel a little fortunate that our jobs are at least stable enough that we can continue them remotely and not have to worry about an employment situation, which unfortunately lots of people do have to deal with right now. So we can go on and do our work, even though that work is very different than it was a week and a half ago. Yeah, no doubt. So let me ask you, Alex, maybe I'll start with you. I want to hear how all this went down from your perspective. Give me the thumbnail of how fast the change was from, you know, everyday school to the announcement that the school was closing, and now you're doing remote learning. So we were kind of sitting around our lunchroom for a while the week before we actually closed and trying to guess when we would be closing based on what other we heard other districts in the country doing. And we went to school last Monday. And I was honestly a little worried about being there, just being around all of my students and knowing that my classroom wasn't as clean as it needed to be. Or, you know, we were just kind of still in the dark at that point. And we did not get the email until Tuesday afternoon saying that starting Wednesday, we would be closed. And so that was definitely alarming. Um, We got the date through April 13th and I was in my seventh hour with my seventh hour kids. And so I just told them that that's, you know, I got the email and we would be out until April 13th. And I did not know how to feel for sure. It was definitely a weird feeling. Some of my students were cheering. Others were kind of looking at me very confused and worried, but we just assured them. And we had been going through our district had set up a questionnaire asking students who had Wi-Fi at home. We were making sure all of our kids have iPads. And so we were making sure on Monday and Tuesday that their iPads were up and working, just kind of preparing because we're actually on spring break this week. And so we were trying to get everything settled before we left for the whole break that we would have like the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of last week to kind of get some things started. And then this week we're really doing nothing until we start the actual remote learning next Monday. Gotcha. But it sounds like the turnaround was pretty quick. I mean, there was lead in is what I'm hearing you say, but the time between the final announcement coming down at that seventh period on a Tuesday and the last time kids are going to be in school was just a a matter of minutes, really. Pretty much. Yeah. So that was a little frustrating. I did share and a lot of people in my building shared the same frustrations that we just had not been receiving any communication from anybody. So that was definitely frustrating because we were just like basically handed an email from our district stating some kind of criteria, but nothing really specific. So we, it's kind of up to the teacher, which is a little frustrating because it's not uniform for everybody. Well, that's one quick question, I, but I want to get uh, Rob and William to, to weigh in as well. Who decided? Was it your district superintendent that decided to shut down or was, did it come down from the state? It came from our superintendent. Okay, so it was a district decision. William, uh, you teach in an elementary school. How was the transition at, uh, for you all at uh, Hillcrest Elementary? Right, we were told on uh, Wednesday, March 11th, that Friday would be an emergency full day in service to uh, get teachers up to speed on our distance learning program. On Thursday, we were told before the end of the day, make sure all the students take their books home with them Thursday. In the event 
that school would be closed. We had our full day in service where we crammed in our program and Saturday afternoon uh, schools were closed officially at that time for two weeks. So that would have been March 14th. So that was that our decision was made by the state, but I think that's what we were waiting for. But we literally had two days of that thought in our minds and really only one day to prepare the staff before yeah. it all happened. I, I imagine one day of PD is better than a lot of people got, <laughs> but still maybe uh, not enough dose uh, for what you would have liked. Right, that. right. Rob, how about you at Democracy Prep? Uh, yeah, I mean, the situation in New York was rapidly changing the week before we closed. So there was a lot of buzz among the students and staff over like not if it was going to happen, but when it was going to happen. But even up to the day we actually closed, which was end up being Friday, March 13th, which is before the whole New York City DOE closed, we're a charter school. We had no word that it was going to happen. And all the information we had was that, well, if it happens, it won't be for another couple of days. And so we actually did have PD as well planned for how to set remote learning. And so we had um, school on Friday and we do half days on Friday. And we actually found out a little before dismissal that we would be closing down as a charter network. I know a couple other charters that day did as well, but it came as a surprise because the DOE had not currently closed. And so we kind of scrambled and made a couple of quick plans in our school, like what is necessary to like get from the school? What do we need to message the kids? We tried to make sure that all kids complete a survey about their technology at home, but it actually worked out pretty well that we had that weekend to plan out for the next week which is more than the deal we actually had um, before that point. Rob, were you able to just pick up at that point and start instruction on Monday? Uh, absolutely not. But uh, <laughs> we were able to do the important part of like outreach to families and making sure that students were ready to kind of work with us. And so we actually spent this last week, we're teaching today and yesterday, uh, but last week was all about working with our staff and working with families to make sure everyone's set up for that learning. Was that during spring break? Uh, no, our spring breaks in April. Okay. So this is just a, a closed district that we're working through. Gotcha. So you're up and running now, Rob, with instruction full on yesterday and today? We just concluded our second day of remote teaching for our high school, yes. Okay, so tell me what that looks like. Synchronous, asynchronous, is this thing done through Google Classroom or some other online platform? Do you actually see your students or are you just sending work back and forth? So we chose a combination to make sure we're reaching as many kids as possible. So we use Google Classroom as our main platform for putting assignments on. And we spent a lot of last week kind of norming what assignments should look like, what they have to include, and then what teachers can kind of modify on their own. And so we did a lot of debate over how much live teaching versus how much pre-recorded lessons will be part of our school. And we came to kind of this agreement that it shouldn't be an or, but it has to be a both. And so for every teacher at our school right now, they do have to make two full 90-minute lessons that are a combination of pre-recorded work, online modules, or some kind of combination of deliverable for students. In addition to that work, we have to be available for a few different office hour sessions every week. That is a combination of like a live help room or a live tutoring session on Zoom. So for example, yesterday I was on from nine to 10 in the morning for a live tutoring session for my students. I was also on from one to 2 p.m. to kind of help students who were kind of busy in the morning or busy in the afternoon. You know, a big part I know of your classroom practice and in classrooms across the nation are, let's have kids work together, right? When kids work together, they learn in a very different way. Do you have a platform or some means for kids to connect? I mean, they're texting, I guarantee you, but is there another platform that they can get together for the express purpose of doing schoolwork projects. Yeah, I mean, Google Classroom has a lot of platforms for like sharing documents, but right now, obviously, they're not working in the same room together. But um, access to Zoom and a lot of the features there uh, through being an educational organization has really let us like see kind of the possibilities um, of having kids kind of communicate with each other or with another staff member uh, and collaborate on things. So, for example, my tutoring. I do a lot of screen sharing of work and we kind of talk through problems together, but definitely we're right now really at the beginning of how do we actually help students work together. Right now, a lot of it is mostly independent or talking to teachers directly. Alex, I'm curious what things are shaping up for you and you are in middle school 
and you teach English, correct? Correct. Yes. So what, what, what does it look like at Jefferson Middle School now that you're not at Jefferson Middle School? So we use um, a program called Schoology, which is similar to a Google Classroom. We were actually finishing up an argumentative essay. I had already assigned it when this whole thing went down. And so I encouraged them, even though my due date can't be a hard due date anymore, we're kind of trying to figure out as a district what we're going to do about grades and due dates and reporting grades and things like that. So I told them that they could get an additional five bonus points if they finished their argumentative essay and submitted it to Schoology by last Friday, which was the original due date. And I actually got some turned in, which was really exciting to see. But I, I teach a reading class as well. So I just went ahead and put copies of our pages on Schoology. And I'm planning on recording myself reading them because my struggling readers are going to need that support because I can't share an audiobook with all of them. Um, but for my English class, we're actually going to start after spring break which is this coming Monday, Romeo and Juliet. So they all have a book. And so what I'm hoping to do is get as many of them on Zoom as possible with my different sections at different times. And so we can actually read the play out loud instead of just having them read it with each other. But trying to figure out how to keep them engaged remotely when, especially I had quite a few students um, in each of my sections that just struggled to stay engaged in the classroom. So I feel like that is going to be the hardest part is making sure that they are still checking their email or checking Schoology or checking things and making sure that they are still engaged in the learning process uh, because I'm really nervous that some of them are gonna fall off. I mean, it can be tough enough to engage all your students when you can reach out and touch them. It's much harder right. when <laughs> the distance is further. But William? Right. You're in the world of elementary school. You teach third grade, is that right? Yes, correct. Third graders are just gonna have a very different relationship to all these things, and I have one, so I know, <laughs> uh, than, than Rob's high school students are, uh, or even Alex's middle school students are. Uh, what is your instruction looking like now, and uh, how are you trying to reach those young third graders? Yeah, our, our district has also decided to utilize Schoology, and that's what we were in service on, that that last day of school. And it, it's certainly in a pinch when we had to learn this very quickly, I think was a good choice. We also always use Google Classroom anyway during the course of regular instruction. So my students are familiar with that. So I certainly could access some curriculum through that with them now. Uh, but officially we're on Schoology, which, which has worked well, but we had some initial problems with, with equity issues about accessibility for all students. So we actually, last Monday, we were on a hold for four days where we, we did not put any of the work out for students until we could get some determination about whether this was being done fairly or not. They came up with a solution of making the work non-mandatory starting last Friday and all week this week. So that's sort of a warm-up period until they could get devices to everyone and check accessibility for all families. I just literally got an email before we went live here that starting next week will be considered a more mandatory lessons where I'll have to not only keep track of who's doing work, but take a form of attendance. Work will be due on a certain time. I'll have to communicate with any parents whose students are not engaged and find out if there's any problem or what the issues may be. As of this point, I'm still every day only getting about half of my students responding to all of the work. So that definitely is a concern for me going forward. Well, it, it it is interesting, and so I'll just ask this sort of in reverse order. On the one hand, though, you know, you could say, well, it seems like school was down for two weeks, and that can seem like a real tragedy. On the other hand, you could say you're up and running in two weeks uh, on a remote platform. So you could look at it as the glass half empty or half full. It's interesting also that you're talking about this shift from mandatory participation from what you've done with talks at the district and also just are looking around the corner at what you're going to have to do next week. How big of a uh, lift do you think that's going to be to really get all those kids uh, engaged in school day to day? I think for me personally, my, my biggest fear is that I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what the challenges are in each home. I'm not sure what the level of uh, supervision is for my students, which it may be difficult for them to access this if they were on their own. I would think of only a few of the students that could independently do this 
completely. They need some help. I don't know what their level of help is. So I think it's probably incumbent upon me to reach out to families and find more information in each household about what's your barrier. Is there a roadblock that you're having? Is it accessibility or just understanding or time? Or So there's lots of questions I think are unanswered that, that would help me if I had those answers. Sure. Alex, what are you worried about as some of your first order problems to address? And, and you know, that's one thing it sounds like um, in, in, at Jefferson Middle School, you're still sort of ramping up your scale before you get mandatory, but I assume at some point it will be, everybody has to be at school, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. So there are initial instructions were that we had to provide office hours for our students, but we also had to provide lessons on our Schoology and just making sure that we're keeping those up to date. We have no requirements in regards to Zoom meetings or anything like that, just because we are also concerned about the equity issue and just making sure that all students, even though we do have hotspots to give students as a district and things like that, we just, we can't catch everybody. And so just making sure that what we are doing is equitable for all of our students. And so I would say that that's probably my biggest concern and where a lot of my emotions have come from in that my students that were at school for the last time on Tuesday were the students that really needed us and needed to be there. And so I've really struggled with that and just making sure that they're getting fed, making sure that they are in a, you know, a safe environment. That's really where my head is right now. I'm getting to the academic side of it, but I just am worried mainly because, you know, there are kids and I want to make sure that they're safe and they're being taken care of. And I feel like I can't do that for the 40 hours a week I see them anymore. And so that's what I'm struggling the most with. And then just seeing when I posted a couple of times as a kind of a test last week on our Schoology, I just posted some discussion questions that I wanted them to answer. And we've created like a class thread. I'm still only seeing like half of them if that respond. You're not the first person to bring up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, safety, health, and and shelter are our first order problems. Rob, I'm, I'm interested in what, what you at Democracy Prep are looking at, at some of your near-term challenges that uh, are, are in your first order to address. Yeah, we started last week by talking about the equity issue. And so our first order of business for any like kind of lesson planning or anything else uh, was like late making live contact with every single family. A lot of that took, honestly, social media, tracking down like phone numbers from kids or even Snapchat, but finding out do you have access to a laptop or Chromebook at home? And do you have access to Wi-Fi or internet? Based on those responses, we had a few distributions to families of our like Chromebooks from school. We literally went to our school building, took all the Chromebooks out of the carts and handed them out to families based on need. New York City is offering through some of the internet service providers like free Wi-Fi at this time for next two months. And so we addressed almost every single issue there as far as the technology aspect. Uh, this week right now, the big issue is more of a software thing. Now that kids have these laptops in front of them, if they're only used to using phones, how do we make sure they're also used to accessing Zoom at home? And so I feel like a lot of our staff this week have been like IT support for kids, uh, literally on phone calls with kids while trying to get their Zoom to work. And so definitely a technology piece has been tough, but echoing um, what they said as well, now trying to get the kids engaged in the material. Um, we're really trying to make sure there's some kind of semblance of structure in their day. We actually have a, a remote schedule set up that's recommended work times for kids. And we even have like little remote lunchrooms that kids can stop by in and like talk to their teachers or other peers to kind of like get their day moving. But we're still running kind of numbers from the first two days to see how engaged kids are. So we're doing like preliminary attendance from both perspective of who's going to tutoring, who's going to help rooms, who's going to lunch even. And we're utilizing every Wednesday as kind of our feedback day. We all have advisories, which kids engage with the work this week, call their parents if they have not or call them directly, uh, which kids completed all their assignments. If they haven't, call them or email them and try to figure out what limits are stopping them from getting there. I don't have an answer, honestly, for my staff that I talk to, how much grading we're going to do this week. A lot of it's just kind of getting them used to like what's going to be expected for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I hear you on being the, the tech support, but really teachers are always whatever their students need them. <laughs> and it just in, in this aspect, you're going to be doing a lot more tech support than uh, direct instruction for the short term. Let me ask you to sort of focus out a little bit. On the one hand, we're just getting up and running. Uh, 
at, at, at Democracy Prep and at Jefferson and at Hillcrest, uh, all your schools and at schools across the nation. And so there's going to be a ramp up. I wonder from your perspective what the ceiling is. It, it occurs to me that obviously it will be better to have kids in school in front of you than to do this remote stuff. Now that we don't have that option, I, I mean, at what percentage of normal educational or operational efficiency can you hope to get to? And I know you don't have a hard answer for that, but how do you even think about it? If, if I could relate uh, after our full day in service with, with Schoology and remote learning, someone turned before we left and said, we'll never have a snow day again. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you can never, if, if your students are ever off, you can just teach mm -hmm. them remotely. So there's the end of a snow day for a teacher. So I thought that was a, and a strange. children are crying everywhere. <laughs> yes, please. and so are teachers. <laughs> well, I think that there's there really is no limit to this. It's, I mean, even with very young students that I teach, I could see that there's just possibilities are endless. And every day someone's texting me another teacher professional. I did this today and I got this to work today and I got this to work, which is amazing. It's like they're using ways that, that even Schoology probably wasn't designed to be used, but they're finding ways to make it more interesting, more accessible. I think there's no limit to what we could do here, although it's certainly no replacement for face-to-face -face learning. Alex, how high do you think the upside is? I would like to do anything and everything that my students are willing to engage with. So if they are good with, you know, I assign pages and we have discussions, whether that's virtually or on Zoom, I would like to try and run my classroom as much as the same as I have. And I feel like with English, that's easier than other subjects because it's just a lot of talking. So if we can just get in on Zoom together and we can just talk and read through the pages. I'm already working on adding some of my voice instruction to old Google Slides presentations that I have that I can push out to them that I would normally be giving them when we're doing something like Romeo and Juliet. What's really a bummer for me is I love teaching Romeo and Juliet as a movie study instead of just using the book so we don't get to watch Leonardo DiCaprio, which is a bummer. Just finding a way to still make it engaging and interesting for them and I'm posting videos to my Schoology just so that they can still see my face and still remember that I'm a real person and I'm their teacher um, and that I'm here for them and things like that. So just anything that I can or that they will be able to engage with. I feel like there really is no ceiling. Rob? Uh, yeah, academically, I think this is actually a pretty cool opportunity for a lot of schools to try to think outside the box and develop some new practices. Like every day, the last week and a half, I have my own vision of like what my online school is going to look like in my own classroom, but teachers I work with are doing a various amount of things. I'm like, oh, I never thought of that. And I think I'm really intrigued about like what practices I can bring back when we actually do go to a physical classroom again. And so on the academic side, as long as we increase that engagement with kids, I'm actually really excited about the possibilities here. I'm more worried about like the social aspects of school and that kind of being a limiting factor. I do think the structure that school provides for kids is going to be very hard to replicate in online fashion. We've been doing so much talking, academics, of course, but like, how do we make sure we're keeping the culture of our school in place? And how do we make sure that students feel, feel close relationship to each other and their teachers past just texting about assignments and past just putting grades in a book? And we have a lot of work doing that front and a lot of brainstorming. It's going to be a big focus tomorrow for our staff, actually. But academically, very excited. Socially, not as excited. And I think that's actually going to be the harder part after a few weeks. Well, let me ask you something about that, Rob. There's, and I'm going to follow up on the social aspect of kids around the horn, but what about collaborations among teachers? I mean, you know, having sort of, whether you want to call it a professional learning community, which teachers have been doing for ages, that is sort of collaborating and bouncing things off of each other and also knowing where everybody is at, that may be harder now that you're not in the building. Have you kept up with your colleagues and maintained that sort of web of collegiality? Honestly, this week I feel like I've talked to them more than I have in a while. Using the Zoom chat rooms, we have so many little threads and so many kind of collaborations. And I think that's really a testament to our leadership, like spending time beginning of last week, one, reaching out to families communication, but two, norming what like staff communication looks like during this time. And that was done way before even lesson plan deadlines. Lesson plans were not even talked about until later on in the week. And so every morning at 8 a.m., we have our breakfast together. 
it's like a staff meeting, whether by grade level, by school. And obviously we don't need to talk that much every morning, but the idea is to keep us engaged with each other. Uh, and I do feel like just like we're giving IT support to kids, a lot of our social time together is kind of doing IT work. I spent probably an hour yesterday in various Zoom rooms testing out settings with other teachers and kind of making jokes about it. And so while obviously it's a different kind of collaboration, at least in my school, our emphasis is on like how do we work together to like push the best kind of remote school we can. So that's actually been one of our priorities. Alex, William, how's your uh, collegial interactions been? Has it, has it been tough? Well, mine, mine has been a little tough because we're forbidden the use of our building. Our building has been closed since, since we closed and we cannot access it at all. We have a text chain that we go through frequently. So that's really good. I really miss that part of it the most because we have a team of, of five in third grade. And we spend a lot of time together because we're in very close proximity. So I see them continuously throughout the day. And that's the part that I miss because we can instantly get ideas, exchange information. And so that part of it is a little bit more difficult. And our principal is trying to work out a way of getting some online meetings that are productive. We had one, but it had about 46 participants and it was very, it was a little chaotic. And and I'm really hoping that we can do that sort of like this face to face. I think it would be much more helpful. Well, I wanted to get 46 teachers on this podcast, but uh, my producer, Matt, said that might be a few many. So I, I can understand how it might be hard. Alex, how about you and your colleagues? So we have exchanged a lot of emails. We have only been out, this is our fifth day out of school, and technically this is our spring break this week. My PLC partner is visiting her grandbaby. She took off right away to Colorado to go hang out with her, took this opportunity to do that. but. We have been talk to, talking about maybe having a virtual happy hour or things like that. Just try to keep the spirits up, I think, is what we're more, more concerned with right now. And just making sure that everyone is trying to stay as positive as possible. But I have been in communication with the other teachers. Not as much as it sounds like you guys have been. But I am sure that once our spring break wraps up here at the end of the week, we will definitely be ramping up that communication just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Alice, you might not have been able to get to this because like you said, your, your kids have been on spring break, but feel free to weigh in. My question in a lot of this is the personal connections that fuel the relationships that make education possible, where teachers are seeing the same kids day after day. And, and now that is, is much, much harder to just have that personal contact. I don't know if there is a, you know, sort of a way to develop that, but um, Rob, William, ha have you figured out ways to actually get an individual contact with your students on a regular basis, or is that proving particularly difficult now that campuses are closed? Well, I, I would say that the good news for me is that I only am responsible for 26 students. I see them all day. But the bad news is that those 26 students I'm used to seeing all day long. I see them from the beginning of the school day until the end, and now I don't see them at all. And you can judge a lot by seeing, especially young students, face-to-face, -face, how they feel, what kind of day they're having, and I can't do any of that. The only communication I do have is they can post answers through Schoology, and I can comment, I can reply to those, I can ask them questions, and then they can or cannot respond to that. But I haven't had any other contact yet. Again, my plan is to reach out to uh, parents this week more directly, because normally that's how I communicate with home anyway, because the students are young, is that I communicate directly with parents. So that's what I'll attempt to do, and maybe through that uh, method, I can get more personal communication with my students. Rob, what about you? I mean, I'm assuming you have far more than 26 students as a high school teacher, right? Yeah, so for the whole geometry cohort, it's definitely tough to reach out to them all individually and track their things. Right now, honestly, part of my day today was tracking who's doing our assignments, sending out proactive emails. But I think the approach our school's taking is making sure each teacher is responsible for a few students at a time. So we're doing this on two fronts, one for advisory. Every Wednesday, we have mandatory advisory meetings on Zoom with kids, and we're going to start that tomorrow. All our advisories from like anywhere from 8 to 15 students. And the goal is this first one to get as many kids as possible in there and then follow up if they're not uh, and making that kind of a structure of the week. While other tutoring rooms might be optional, this is our time to kind of connect. And then we really want to emphasize making sure we continue supporting our special education program. 
we've got a lot of our general education teachers and our special education teachers. And we basically made this huge spreadsheet of little cohorts of like four to five students each in their different sections. So for example, I'm in charge of 11th grade math students in special education on Tuesdays. And I have five students in there. And today we met for an hour. And part of that was talking about math, part of it was support, but part of it was also talking about what movies are sad and not gonna see. We're talking about the Fast and the Furious and how it's not come out for a year. And kind of making sure they know that there is a place to still relax, talk about things, and it's not just academic supports. So I think like divide and conquer is our biggest strategy here. But as a high school, we have a lot of staff members to do that. So I appreciate all these perspectives. I want to ask you to predict the future because I want to know and I'm sure you want to know. How long do you expect to have to teach remotely? Are you expecting this to last throughout the rest of the year? Are you hoping that, that we might get back in a month? From a teacher's perspective, what's the rest of this year look like? Alex? So today, Columbia just ordered a stay at home until April 24th. Our original go back to school day was April 13th. That was a little hard to know that it's going to be longer than we anticipated. But if we get to go back on April 27th, that still gives us a full month until our technical end of school date, which is May 27th. I'm trying to, I'm a big picture kind of person, and I'm being told that that is not the, the method you want to use right now, so trying to take it day by day. Um, but as an eighth grade teacher, my heart hurts. And as a former high school teacher, my heart hurts for those seniors in high school, eighth graders who are finishing up kind of a milestone year in their lives. And so I would love to be able to see my eighth graders again before I do send them off to high school. I'm praying that we are not done with this school year. Yes. I don't think you're alone, Alex. <laughs> Rob? So in New York, our school goes to the end of June, where all the regions exams are. Originally, our date for coming back was going to be April 20th in my own personal opinion, is that date will probably be extended pretty soon. I personally don't foresee us going back to a regular school year this school year. And in my mind, I'm kind of making sure my instruction is as strong as possible for that possibility. I'm hoping to get back. I think that the schools will probably not come back in New York before the summer. We haven't had a conversation even on campus about that possibility. We're really focusing on, given that our comeback day is April 20th, what's the best thing we can do before that date? But my personal opinion is, it probably will not be ready to go by that point. Well, we can certainly hope for better, but certainly New York is sort of the epicenter right now and, and looking like it's going to be a particularly rough ride. William, you're in the outskirts of Philadelphia, yes, right? Yes, correct. Do you foresee a different plan in Philadelphia where the facts on the ground are a little different? Well, oddly enough, yesterday our superintendent forwarded us an email from the Pennsylvania Secretary of Education, and he said possibly teachers could return on the 7th and 8th to prepare for students returning uh, as soon as April 9th. Now, they've since district-wide have closed us until April 13th, but I thought it was odd that even the Secretary of Education was considering any type of uh, comeback plan. It, to me, I thought that was the first good news I'd heard in two weeks. Now, I don't think that that's a date that's realistic, but my, my personal hope is that by May 1st, we'll be able to return to the classroom because especially with young students that I have, I really feel like part of their year is being stolen by coronavirus because it can't really be made up. We can't certainly do it online. It's just, just from an interpersonal uh, perspective for them, uh, just socially in every kind of way. It's, you know, every week that we're out is more and more harmful to them overall, not just educationally. So uh, my hope is by May 1st, and that would give us, so we would have six weeks from that time until our technical end of school. I think we have to finish schooling in Pennsylvania by June 30th, which is the end of a fiscal year. So that could even potentially give us two months, which would certainly go a long way toward making up what we've missed. So I appreciate you all coming on here. And I want to sort of go out by asking you to give me some advice and other parents who have three kids at home. What the heck can I do to help my kids as all of a sudden I'm a homeschool dad and, you know, I've been out of the classroom for a long time. So any advice to parents out there who are now trying to figure out what to do with these kids that are always underfoot? Well, ev every day I'm finding out more and more free online resources that, that for-profit companies are opening up. Scholastic has done that, opened up libraries online for, for students, uh, something called Epic. Uh, is, is a fantastic resource of games and books that can be 
shown online and read online or read to someone. There's just a whole bunch of different things. So there's just more and more coming on that companies are opening up for free that are just fantastic resources of materials. Again, I'm looking at it from an elementary viewpoint, and I think it's been spectacular. I've been very impressed with what I've seen offered. I'll look it up. Any last minute advice for, for parents? I would encourage parents to encourage their students that this would be a really good time to practice advocating for themselves and communicating with their teachers through email or through another online platform and that you know parents can only do so much especially when the content gets a little bit more specific and a little bit more difficult out of the elementary range so just encouraging those students to try to stay on task and get what they need to get done and not beat themselves up the parents especially if they are confused and not knowing how to help their kids academically just supporting them and you know, reach out to your teacher, see what you can do. And just really practicing those self-advocating skills would be, this would be a really good time for that. They could also screen that Leonardo DiCaprio version of <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, right? That would be awesome. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there. Rob? One of the best part of the staff Zoom meetings is the staff members with kids. You always hear the kids in the background. So teachers are also having a lot of trouble with their kids at home. <laughs> what I would say for high schools, I think especially because we're trying a lot of different platforms, technologies, parents should try out some of these lessons with their kids, see what it looks like these days compared to what their high school experience is like. It might make it easier to tell a student, oh, get to work or try out your work if you actually know what it looks like. But I really think that this is a great opportunity for especially older kids to kind of get used to some of the technology you're going to see in college. And I know that for me, I'm still thinking about how can I make this model what they might see in two or three years? But seriously, it's tough. I mean, I don't have kids, so I'm not there, but good luck. Well, thank you all for coming on the report card and give us your perspective. And thank you all for your hard work for uh, America's school children. You and your, your peers across the nation are really in the trenches right now, and we appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you, Nat. Thanks for listening to the report card with Nat Malkus, and special thanks to our guests. William Bell, Alex Wendell, and Rob Casilli. Thanks also to the producers who make this podcast possible. That's Matt Rice and Gage Hurley of Liquid Media. Remember, you can subscribe to The Report Card on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, take a minute to leave a review and help other folks find the podcast. As always, send comments, questions, or topic suggestions to ed.podcast at AEI.org. Signing off for this week, I'm Matt Malkus.